Throb Singh, I have one question. Why is your smile so cute? Let me ask my parents. Hi everyone, welcome to this commemorative 15k subscriber Q&A. This video was supposed to be a 10k subscriber Q&A, but since I got terribly sick last week and I lost my voice completely, hence we are now having the 15k subscriber Q&A instead. But really, I have nothing to complain. Thank you to all of you who have been a supporter and subscriber of this channel. We have collected about 35 questions from you guys. Some of you posted 5 or 6 questions to me, but I took the liberty to answer only a few of them that I like the most. So let's go! Okay, Yi Yin Huang. I would really love to know how much time do you usually take to work, learn, produce? What is your belief on work-life balance? Because being female and a caregiver, I often struggle with this. Good question. I can totally relate to this struggle even though I'm not a caregiver yet. My view on work-life balance is that I try to do as much of the things that I enjoy. So even if I work a lot more hours than a, an average person, as long as I can keep doing things that I enjoy, then it still feels very fulfilling for me and I feel like I have more energy to do these things. So among work, learn and produce, I spend roughly 60, 20, 20 to each of them. It is not perfect and I spend still a ton of time at work but I feel like, okay, I still have the chance to to learn new things through my study. I still have the chance to be creative with this YouTube channel. So that is what I think of as work-life balance. And nowadays at work, I also try to be more selective in the kinds of projects that I take on and make sure that this is something that I would want to do. And yeah, I also try to blend things into my work as much as possible. So during the lunch break, I might try to brainstorm on some video ideas or I can try to answer some of your comments. So I think this blending of approach is a little bit more realistic than trying to perfectly compartmentalize all different aspects of your life. I feel like life is way too messy to try to do that. So that's my take on work-life balance. Yesi Villa, is data analytics a stressful lifestyle, meaning you are constantly having to work overtime because you can't find out the answer or something? My answer is no. To me, data analytics and data science is a pretty chill job most of the time. You can be creative, analytical, try new stuff, and most of the time no one really understand what you are doing, which is great. From my experience, it only gets more stressful if you're working on a more high-stake project. For example, you are developing a lung cancer detection kind of model, or if you're developing some kind of advanced credit risk model for a bank that could potentially impact like hundreds of thousands of clients who are trying to get a loan. How often Excel set, Tableau, Python, etc. would you say you spend the most time on? I say I spend most of my time on R and Python, and also JavaScript script if I'm developing some sort of web applications. In some project, we definitely use Power BI and Tableau as well, especially if that's what the client wants. But in recent years, I've tried to move away from the BI tools and move a little bit towards the uh, building the customizable visualization. Nahid says, after getting to know the basics of programming, how can we make transition to portfolio projects and most importantly showcase them? How many projects are optimal and minimum for portfolio? In the ideal world, of course, the more the better because the more projects you have in your portfolio, the more different parts of your skill set you can showcase potentially. But generally, I would say four or five high quality projects is more than enough. I also detailed it in another video a while ago about what kind of project you should include in your portfolio. For showcasing project, I would say the easiest way to do is probably to build a very simple HTML portfolio website and you can link all different projects to that website. So link to your GitHub repo or the Tableau dashboard that you have. Matt says, I'd love to hear from you about your time in Vietnam, South or North. What made you want to learn English and move abroad? How come you chose the Netherlands and do you have a Vietnamese community here? Uh, I come from the north of Vietnam, not precisely Hanoi, the capital, but a little bit like a village a hundred kilometers from there. This is me and my dad a few years back. We were fetching the ducks home uh, in the afternoon in the river near my house. I don't know, since I was a kid, I've always wanted to go abroad and to explore the world and to meet new people and to make the best out of my life. So yeah, it came very natural for me to learn English. I chose the Netherlands not because 
I was such a big fan of tulips and coffee shops in Amsterdam, but more because I got a scholarship at the uh, university here in Amsterdam, and that was the main reason why I chose to study here. Raven says, so I'm also planning to take another bachelor's. What do you think would be beneficial if I want to go to an IT business analyst track to study CS or straight up to go to a bachelor's in data science? For bachelor's studies, I would generally prefer to go for a field that is a little bit more established. A bachelor's in data science for me sounds a little bit weaker than a bachelor in computer science because data science is like a little bit of a mix of computer science, math and statistics and domain knowledge. So it feels like you're dabbling uh, in many different fields but not having a strong focus in a specific field in your bachelor study. That's why I generally recommend people to go for data science only later in their study, for example, for masters instead of a, a bachelor's. Bruno says, I'm a physicist with a PhD, strong knowledge in statistics, and experience in scientific programming in R, but without experience in industry. Should I try to position as a data scientist at an entry level or a high level? I would say this depends on the kind of companies you are applying for. If this is a like a small company, like for example a startup, they'll be very much more likely to give you a more senior position in the team if you have a PhD and some transferable skills. But if you're applying for a larger company, generally you would have to compete with people who actually have a lot of previous working experience already, and so it might be more difficult to negotiate a more senior level. For example, at my company, that is a quite large consulting firm, generally people who go straight out of their PhD without any industry experience will generally start with a, a, an entry-level position, but if they do well, they would very rapidly move up to the more senior position. Sometimes it's just a, a matter of months. I'm sorry I cannot read your name. I'm a Taiwanese and will be starting my PhD in the US this fall semester. Would you like to share your experience in studying abroad? Like what did you find the most difficult challenge and how did you deal with them? Well, going abroad has been one of the best decisions I've made in my life. I would choose to do it a thousand thousand times again. It's really changed the way I see the world and I've met incredible, incredible people. The most difficult challenge for me was really to believe in myself and to stand up for myself in all circumstances. I believe everyone will have a different experience going abroad, but for me, coming from a more modest background, moving to the Netherlands, being a broke student for most of the time, and uh, not knowing the native languages and the culture, and the chance of getting a job for me was very, very slim back then. It was hard for me to keep my head up sometimes. I remember I was cleaning houses for most of a year to earn some extra cash to buy groceries because my scholarship money was running out quickly after a while living here. I remember at least once bursting into tears on the phone with my mom, having a like a major emotional breakdown and like a quite a life crisis and saying things like, oh, I'm so unworthy, I'm so incapable, how am I gonna make it, that sort of things. But with all the pressure and self-doubt set aside, I have to say, that I had such an amazing time studying in Amsterdam. I really had like the best parties in my life and yeah, I would choose to do it a thousand times again. Jimmy Direct, I would like to ask how you approach dealing with math specifically on those that are technical. I ask this question because I'm majoring in statistics and I'm not doing as well as I hope. Do you have any tips for me and for those who want to study statistics but also not get overwhelmed and discouraged? Well, you're definitely not the only one who feel imposter or overwhelmed overwhelmed in math and statistics, and my approach is generally to try to make learning math and statistics as fun as possible. As a visual learner, I lean very heavily on visual tools to learn about new concepts. I also made a video a, a while ago about what kind of tools that I use for learning math and statistics. Carabo says, at what point can one use data scientist, data science consultant title when you get a corporate job after freelancing, after Coursera certificates, a few projects, or as soon as you import pandas as PD? I would say after a few real world projects, being a volunteer project, or a freelancing project or project at work. The reason why I prefer using projects to measure your skill is because, well, that's literally the end goal of 
knowing all about these data science stuff, you want to generate insights and to help solve a specific problems. That's what it's all about. So having a few sufficiently quality and large projects under your belt is the most credible way to call yourself a data scientist or whatever you want to call yourself. Jenny says, I'm curious your thoughts on pros and cons of working in data analytics at a consulting firm versus industry. Well, I think a consulting firm is good if you like to switch between different projects and learn many different skills in a short amount of time. You also get to learn about a lot of different industries through your projects and uh, build a broad professional network through working at clients. The downside is that you get less time to learn a skill because you always have this time pressure to deliver at clients and so you might not have enough time to delve deeper into a specific topic. And the thing that I hate the most about being a consultant is that you always have to justify your hours. You always have to fill in your time sheet sometimes like every day which is very very annoying. So yeah in this respect sometimes it feels a little bit more chill to work in an industry but it can differ from one job to another. Aman says it be great for us if you start a tutorial on advanced data science concept. There are a lot of tutorials on YouTube with basic tutorial focusing on those who want to start their career in data science. However, many of us are quite familiar with it now. Thanks a lot for the suggestions. I've been thinking a lot about the next steps for this channel. At the moment, I don't think that I'll focus on teaching data science concepts like you'd have in courses or in a data science degree. Instead, I think I'd rely a little bit more on the project-based kind of approach. So I'll blend in some explanation about advanced uh, data science concepts and theories when necessary, but the main goal would be still to create a project. George asks, how old are you? It's okay if you don't want to answer this. Well, I can answer this. I generally don't feel offended when people ask about my age. So I'm 29 years old. I'm turning 30 somewhere uh, later this year in a few months. So yeah, I'm pretty old and 30 sounds really scary to me. The second question he has is how much time it took you to become an independent professional on the data analytics field? I'll say it took me about three to four years to really feel confident and established in the field. The first one to two years were mostly like learning on a job and you're basically doing the things that people tell you to do. Only after a few years, I start feeling more confident about uh, about like being independent, manage a project by myself. Sunda asks, how much mathematics do we need to learn for data analytics and machine learning? So a similar question from Animesh, how much of mathematics do we need to learn for data science if our long-term goal is a PhD in it? I'm currently working as a cloud migration engineer and would like to switch to a data analytics job role. Well, at the minimum, the three kinds of mathematics you need for data analytics and machine learning is linear algebra, calculus, statistics, and probability. If you search for math for data science, you probably find a bunch of uh, medium articles about exactly how like the roadmap for learning mathematics for data science and also uh, there are a lot, a lot of free resources out there for you to learn. Yeah, so that's what I will start with and of course you don't have to learn everything at once. Uh, I would generally just learn things that are needed for your project first and then expand from there. Adama asks, how long do you think it would take for one to start learning data analytics beginner? level and be ready to apply for jobs. If you can focus 1% on learning and have a very rigorous planning, I'd say six months is probably enough to get a head start in, you know, learning some advanced Excel and SQL and uh, learning a little bit R and Python and also learning some uh, data visualization and BI tools like Tableau and Power BI. But note that when applying for a job, you generally have to showcase some kind of real world experience, uh, generally like a volunteer project or internship or some kind of project that uh, like you are doing by yourself and so generally it would take a few extra months to build a portfolio project like that so do take that into account in your planning. Farrakh says how did you handle imposter syndrome as a junior data analyst? Yeah it's completely normal to feel imposter as a junior data analyst when you're just learning and you probably feel worse than everyone else in the team but keep in mind that feeling imposter is actually good. It shows that you are learning new skills and you are operating out of your comfort zone. So it's definitely a positive thing if you think about it. Only when that imposter feeling causes you stress and anxiety at work, then it is a problem. And in that case, I would recommend you to uh, have a conversation or have a coffee with your 
team lead or someone in your team who you can trust uh, and talk about these things. In one of my projects recently, I had it quite bad when I felt like, oh, I'm, like I was such a fraud in the team. You know, in a team at my work where uh, everyone has a master or BSD in mathematics and uh, physics and uh, all that. And if I felt like the dumbest person in the room all the time and it really caused me anxiety. Uh, in the end, I had a coffee with uh, one of my colleagues in the team and he said something like, no, you are doing well and we are not expecting anything more from you at this point, so don't feel stressed out about this. And that was all I needed to hear. Sam says, could you address how you network to find a job? I understand that I should connect on LinkedIn and join career fair, but I don't know how I should talk to network with them. Honestly, I've never found a job through a LinkedIn connection or a career fair. Mostly it was through my internship, through my previous job working experience or, uh, you know, like through a personal connection. So I'm very sorry, I cannot really give you any advice on this. Misong Anong says, what is your preferred development environment to build an end-to-end -end neuroscience project? Well, if it's in Python, I would definitely say it's uh, Jupyter Lab. <laughs> and uh, if it's a web application, I would uh, definitely say it is a Visual Studio Code. If it's in R, uh, then definitely R Studio is my favorite environment to work in. Oleg Gas says, I would like to know the interview process of data analysts, including what questions or tests for the interview. Well, I've made a whole dedicated video on the interview process for a data analyst position, so please feel free to check it out. Second question he has is, will there be a case for mixing data analyst and data scientist job? If I understand correctly, then you are asking whether uh, there's any overlap between data analyst and data scientist position, well, definitely there is a lot of overlapping. And in my case, I work as a data science consultant. I'm kind of like doing everything. So I don't even know how to call myself. So yeah, in real world, I find it very, very difficult to really concretely distinguish between these two roles. Data Nash, how do you manage to work at a fan company and still have time for YouTube and personal life? Well, I'm not working for a fan company, but I do work for a large consulting firm. I just try to make time for things that I enjoy doing and YouTube is definitely one of the things that I really like because it's kind of like a creative outlet for me and it keeps me learning and it keeps me happy sharing knowledge and meeting interesting people like you guys. So most of the time I generally don't have time to watch uh, TV and Netflix and stay on top of like new movie release for example. But yeah, I think it, it all comes down to having priorities and uh, make time for what matters to you. Ashit says, how much data structure and algorithm is needed for a better data science career? So I'd say data structure and algorithm one and two in a computer science bachelor study is probably enough for you uh, in your data science career. I'll link some of the free resources below so you can uh, take a look at them. But I would generally only worry about data structure and algorithm later in your data science career. When you start running into things like you have to, to understand different data structures to store your data efficiently and also algorithms as well. For example, if you are working on a project that is about graphs, then knowing the graph data structure and what kind of algorithms you can perform fall on the graphs is definitely very handy and also one of the most important concepts to know is the uh, time complexity of an algorithm. So if you read a documentation about an algorithm, for example support vector machine, and it says the time complexity increases exponentially to the size of the data set, then you know, okay, this algorithm is not suitable for large data set and that's why you might not want to use support vector machine for large data set and for text data set for example. Carlos says, what are some books that help you in your career and your life? Very good question. I definitely think that there are many, many books that have contributed to who I am today and have helped me in several stages of my career and my life. I would say the book The Power of Now of Eckhart Tolle is probably one of the most profound books for me spiritually. The message of the book is quite simple. So living in the now is the truest path to happiness. It says things like nothing happened in the past. It happened in the now. Nothing will happen in the future. It will happen in the now. Also very much 
much like the book series of Thich Nhat Hanh about mindfulness and meditation. Another book that has helped me with uh, like managing time and uh, getting things done is definitely the book Make Time by Dick Knapp and Joan Zerusky. And this book teaches me the concept of having a daily highlight and making a mind-do list. And it's been a complete game changer for me to start focusing on what really matters. Thank you very much to all of you who have posted your questions and I hope that my answers were somewhat helpful. If you still have more questions, please feel free to drop them in the comment section down below and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye!